Today I'm going to be talking about microbial biosignatures in the deep terrestrial subsurface, and I'll be specifically focusing on the approaches of PLFA analysis and carbon isotope analyses for investigating these microbial systems. So when we talk about life in the deep terrestrial subsurface, we're talking specifically about life in the continental crust. So these are microorganisms that live several kilometers deep in natural fractures within crystalline rock. And we call these systems extreme environments due to the high temperatures and pressures as well as low nutrient availability in these systems. And despite these conditions, we still see that microbial communities are surviving for geological timescales within these environments. So, of course, for astrobiologists, this is an important question or important system to look at just because we're wondering, is there a possibility that there's life in the subsurface of other planets or of moons, and how could they survive over geological timescales? So this diagram is a representation of the carbon cycle in the deep terrestrial subsurface. So in yellow boxes, we have the carbon pools, and in the black boxes, we have the um, organisms involved. So the Earth's surface and the shallow subsurface are ultimately dependent on the photosphere. We have photosynthesis. Um, oops. So we have photosynthesis up here, um, producing oxygen and organic carbon. And this organic carbon is either buried or it's utilized by heterotrophic organisms such as sulfate-reducing bacteria and iron reducers. Um, as we go deeper in the subsurface, this organic carbon may become unavailable for heterotrophs and organisms are going to have to rely on an alternative mechanism to fix carbon. So one hypothesis is a hydrogen-driven chemolithoautotrophic community. Um, and this is based on uh, the concept that hydrogen is produced by abiotic processes such as outgassing, water rock interaction, and radiolytic decomposition of water. And this hydrogen can be utilized by acetogens and methanogens to produce acetate and methane. And acetoclastic methanogens can utilize this acetate and produce methane. And all this methane that is produced can be utilized by methanotrophic bacteria, which produce hydrogen and CO2 as a result. So evidently, methane is an important, uh, uh, important point in this, in this um, deep subsurface biosphere. So in this study, we're using phospholipid fatty acids as biosignatures for viable microbial communities. So phospholipids are a major component of bacterial and eukaryotic cell membranes, and they're known to degrade rapidly upon cell death. So as a result, we can use these as indicators for microbial life that is actually alive. Secondly, we can look at the concentrations of the PLFA to estimate the cell densities within these environments. And thirdly, we can look at the composition of the PLFAs to get an idea of what kind of microbial communities or what kind of microorganisms are present in these communities. So in addition to PLFA analysis, we've used two carbon isotope analyses. And the first one is delta C13, which we heard a little bit about yesterday. Um, and what we're interested in for this technique is uh, C12 and C13 only, not C14. And to illustrate this concept, I've included these, uh, these three carbon sources, dissolved inorganic carbon, dissolved organic carbon, and methane. And autotrophy, heterotrophy, and methanotrophy are the processes by which microorganisms will uptake this carbon from these sources. And they may use this carbon to produce PLFA. So the important point for delta C13 analysis is that microorganisms preferentially use the lighter carbon isotope, C12. So if we have a ratio um, or a particular delta C13 value for the carbon source, um, which is basically the ratio of C13 to C12, if a microorganism uptakes that carbon, it'll preferentially use C12, so that ratio will decrease and we'll see a more negative delta C13. And then when they produce PLFA, you'll also see that fractionation the PLFA will be even more depleted. And the extent of this uh, fractionation depends on the metabolism. So we can look at these delta C13 values to think about what kind of metabolisms are occurring in these systems. The second carbon isotope analysis or technique that we use is radiocarbon. And this is based on the idea that 
C14 is radioactive and it decays over time. So in this case, if we have a certain amount of C14 um, in your carbon source, uh, we won't see that fractionation effect um, due to the equations that we're using uh, for delta, C13, delta C14. Um, so in this case, if a microorganism is using one particular carbon source that has a specific delta 14 C value, we should see that same value in the microbial biomass. And again, in the PLFA. So we can look at the microbial carbon source using this technique. So sampling from the deep subsurface is difficult just because of the inaccessibility of these, of these systems. But luckily, some of the deepest mines in the world are located in South Africa, and they provide us with access to these systems up to 3.5 kilometers depth. So basically, uh, the exploratory boreholes that they drill into the walls of the tunnels can sometimes tap into reservoirs of water, which may contain microbial communities. And what we do is go down into these mines and filter this water, and then do analyses such as PLFA analysis, or other people are doing like DNA analysis, just to gain insight into who's there. So in this system, or in this study, we are looking at six samples from four different mines, and these four mines are Driefontein, Teutona, Kloof, and Beatrix. And the depths of these samples come from about one kilometer depth to about 3.5. So we looked at, we extracted PLFA from the six samples and used those concentrations of PLFA to estimate cell densities within these, within these environments. So as you can see, the cell densities are actually very low in all, all across the six samples, um, at less than 10 to the 5 cells per milliliter of water. And this is consistent with direct cell counts via microscopy, as well as previous investigations of other subsurface <coughs> environments. And in the case of Kloof, this is an extremely low cell density. Um, it's actually estimated at about 20 cells per mil. So for those of you who are microbiologists, you'll probably appreciate that this is extremely low and slightly, or very interesting, uh, because this raises the question for us as to whether there's actually anything living there. Perhaps this is actually just background contamination. So we also looked at the um, composition of the PLFA to identify different microbial groups. And this uh, diagram here just represents um, the differences between the different systems. So what we see when we look at this is that they do the composition of the communities varies. And we see um, some similar some similarities between the two Beatrix samples. Uh, Driefontein contained evidence for gram-positive bacteria and sulfate reducers. Tautona 1 and 2 and Beatrix 1 and 2 um, contain these cyclic PLFA, which are um, indicators for uh, microbial responses to environmental stressors, such as nutrient dep deprivation. But overall, what we find from this is that we're seeing differences in the microbial community, so we're probably going to see differences in metabolisms. And this is, in fact, what we see. We see um, here, we're looking at the delta C13 values of PLFA, which are indicated by the orange boxes. And then we also have uh, three potential carbon sources, dissolved inorganic carbon, dissolved organic carbon, and methane. And for Driefontein, we saw very depleted PLFA. And the negative offset from methane is indicative of some utilization of methane as a carbon source, so methanotrophy. For Tautona 1 and Tautona 2 and Beatrix, uh, the negative offset from the uh, DIC to PLFA is indicative of autotrophic communities. And then for Beatrix, we actually see, we, we, we think that there's a combination of methanotrophic activity as well as um, autotrophy. In terms of Kloof, this is the sample with a very low cell density. Um, we didn't have enough PLFA for delta C13 analysis, um, but the, these uh, values for DIC and methane are consistent with a lack of methanogenesis and abiotic methane. So that's interesting in terms of a lack of methanogens in the system. And we also used radiocarbon analysis, um, delta C14, and to confirm the carbon sources. So for Driefontein, 
the PLFA were slightly more enriched than the dissolved inorganic carbon and methane. Uh, so it looks like there is some influence from these two carbon pools, but perhaps there's slightly younger carbon coming in as well. For Tautona 1, it's consistent with what we saw um, with Delta C13. They're utilizing DIC as a carbon source, so autotrophic processes. And for Tautona 2, same, same thing, um, consistent with autotrophic processes. And Beatrix, again, it looks like there's, they're utilizing DIC and methane, so autotrophy and methanotrophy. And as you'll notice, we, haven't, we don't have measurements for DOC here, so organic carbon, um, just because in these systems, organic carbon is usually very low. And so it's, in all these cases, it's very difficult to measure radiocarbon. So we have to keep that in mind. So basically, uh, my overall conclusions from this is that phospholipid fatty acid analysis is a, a useful tool for looking at viable microbial communities in the deep terrestrial subsurface. Carbon isotopes can provide insight into the microbial metabolism, metabolisms that are occurring in these systems. And in, in the case of our samples, we observed PLFA in all of our samples, extremely low cell densities in some of them, particularly in the one sample kloof. And we also observed a range of microbial metabolisms, including methanotrophy and autotrophy. So the presence of these, or the observation of these two metabolisms is consistent with perhaps a chemolitho-autotrophic community. So again, as astrobiologists, I'm just highlighting the implications of this study. Worth wondering, is there life on the subsurface of other planets and moons? So could, in, if we had a system um, or a planet that, you know, the, the surface of the planet or moon was inhospitable to life, could there be life surviving independent of the photosphere? And could those microbial communities survive over geological timescales? And so this point is um, very interesting for the, some of you may have heard about a month ago, there was a paper in um, Nature by Holland et al. And they actually are looking in a different mine site in Canada. And they have found um, water that is about 2.7 billion years old. And in our systems, we are seeing very old water, like approximately 20 million years old. But to see microbial communities living in a system that is 2.7 billion years old is pretty incredible. So um, just a, a note for you guys to look at that. And then also, just as another point, um, survival through the late heavy bombardment. If um, This is kind of an origins question, but in the early Earth, maybe the surface of the Earth could have been sterilized by that 3.8 billion years ago. There's the uh, meteorite impacts. And um, could life have survived through that by living in the subsurface? So overall, there's lots of astrobiological implications. And I uh, just want to thank the South Africa gold mines for providing us with access to these systems, because otherwise we would never be able to look at them. And also my collaborators, um, Telus Onstott, Barbara sherwood Lawler, Kenna Wilkie, uh, Eric Womack and Eric Zakowski and my lab group, including my supervisor, Greg Slater. Thanks. I'm particularly interested where you're looking at the carbon-14 and yeah. the site where you had the highest percentage of uh, carbon-14 incorporated in your organic material. Yeah. The fact that yeah, it looks like your metabolisms were doing DOC, the fact that there's any carbon-14 at all, do you think that you're still getting just telegraphed stuff from the surface? I mean, if it's been relic for a million years, there shouldn't be any carbon-14, really. Exactly. Um, it depends on the system. So I haven't included exactly the ages of these systems, um, and I can't remember them all part, um, you know, by heart. But I, um, yes, you know, we have to think about um, where is this organic carbon coming from, and um, in some cases, we did measure a dissolved or organic carbon, um, radiocarbon measurement, and uh, it's actually very difficult to do because we use these resin columns. I actually don't do it personally, but our collaborators do. And um, you know, sometimes we have to think about whether we're introducing young organic carbon to that pool. So, um, yeah. So I don't know. I. Yeah, it's something to think about whether, like, what, how much influence there is from the surface, which is exactly what, what we're looking at. It's, 
can, you know, are they completely isolated or is there some input? I'm just wondering whether either you or any of your collaborators uh, have done or are thinking about doing any culture-based work with this system, trying to actually grow up anything that's down there. Uh, you know, we have such a like such a huge group of collaborators um, doing everything. You know, DNA analysis. I I believe we do have some doing culture work, um, but I'm not entirely sure on that. So yeah, it would be interesting. But. So with respect to the methanotrophy, uh, is your system totally anoxic or do you get, can the PLFA analysis hint uh, towards which type of methanotrophy this, uh, these uh, communities are undergoing? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question because methanotrophy is typically an um, aerobic process, but then you have the anaerobic process of methanogen, uh, methanotrophs and the anamoxum, right? So, um, with, which is a kind of a consortium of uh, methanotrophic bacteria and um, sulfate reducers, I believe. Or archaea, methan but Ar yeah. Yeah, archaea. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting question because we actually, for that one sample that was always on the left of the graphs where we saw methanotrophy, or, you know, it, the carbon isotopes definitely say methanotrophy. Um, we're not actually seeing the biomarkers for methanotrophy. So there's a couple PLFA biomarkers that are indicative of methanotrophs, uh, um, aerobic methanotrophs. So we're not seeing those. So that's what I'm, start, I'm trying to think about is like, you know, how, what is actually occurring here? Because, or, you know, maybe methan not all methanotrophs have those biomarkers. So, um, but yeah, I mean, if I could see those biomarkers, then I would know for sure that it is aerobic. Um, but we do we do have oxygen in some of these systems, so yeah. Do you have any uh, data on the nitrate present? Because that's an alternative uh, pathway for bacterial methanotrophy under anoxic conditions. Uh, you know what? Actually, can't, I can't really think offhand of what we have. Yeah, for nitrate. But thanks. Thanks. Right, last question, I think. I'm just out of curiosity. How do you date water? How do you date water? Like, how do you find something that's 2.7 billion yeah. years? Just out of somebody might ignorant. know this better than me, but I believe it's having to do with um, oxygen isotopes and hydrogen isotopes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I see nodding heads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's thank Danielle again and all our speakers from this morning.